Thomas Wayne Ovas, what's up, brother? Hello, homie. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. So I wanted to, uh, you know, when, when I had to get permission from the JBL, and I put in there that so many people, when they ask about you, they have this look on their face, like pride. And I, quite frankly, tired of answering questions and telling stories. So I figured you'd be the <laughs> best person to hear from your mouth what's been going on. Uh, yeah. I appreciate you taking out the time, Big. Can, do I call you Thomas Wayne Hovass or do I call you uh, Coach Hovey? Or does it matter? Uh, you just don't call me Lenny. <laughs> I promise. I promise. Not. So let's start uh, where we began. How, how did you pick? Penn State, or how did uh, Penn State pick you? Which what was it? Uh, I grew up. I was in Whitefield, Colorado, and uh, Jerry Dunn's the assistant coach at Penn State. Jerry Dunn's twin brother Terry was a head coach at a high school at a rival high school, <clears throat> and uh, they started talking, and that kind of started things rolling. Yeah. So I, I mean, I hate to admit this, but. By far, you were the top recruit in our class. There was five of us: me, you, Bruce Blake. Yeah, I don't Ed think so. I don't uh, think Ed, so. You said you you think so, or you don't think so? Oh, I do not think so. You guys were all good. Shoot, it was uh, it was a good class. I'm trying yeah. to figure out the planning here. It was a really good class. I was, um, you know, as a, as a freshman, you never have, you know, the confidence going into something that big but you know once we started going I started feeling better about myself and uh, it all worked out okay so a little bit of modesty you're a Colorado player of the year um I was meant I was naming it and it was Mike Collins and then we added Christian Appleman to our class we lost Mike but uh, what sticks out to me is I felt the same way that you did like you know am I going to be able to make this leap and, you know, it seems like within a week of playing pickup, um, we felt like we were at least going to get some quality time. And no knock on the older guys, but they were kind of the uh, result of a transition. So a lot of guys left, and I think they didn't have the confidence um, about winning um, yeah. because of what had gone on. I think they only won like eight games before we got there, right? Yeah, I think it was eight or seven maybe. Yeah, and it seemed like we had, we made a concerted effort because <laughs> I, I don't know anybody who knows us uh, would think we were lacking confidence. But you know, you just you don't want to be overconfident, but you're just no, you're just not sure about that leap. And I yeah. also I, I remember there there was two things. Number one, that as a class we decided we wanted to make sure we left it in better condition than when we got there, and that we were going to market ourselves to people as friends to get them to go to games instead of, you know, just depending on, hey, we're going to win, so come, right? L didn't you feel that? I've never consciously thought of marketing it like that. I, we were just being ourselves. We're, yeah. not, <laughs> we're not shy. <laughs> yeah, so if people were coming to the games for us uh, more than expecting wins, which I think helped a lot because it was, it was kind of like a – a slow build. Uh, what what were uh, some of the biggest challenges? Like over all four years, do you think? Wow. Uh, moving from Colorado to Penn State, just that first year was difficult. Leaving home and being homesick. Getting used to. In in high school, I had a coach that was positive and none he really didn't yell that much and then I got thrown into the fire at Penn State so that was difficult <laughs> and we say that out. with love right because yeah. you know the coach was so his his X and O's cannot be matched as far as I'm concerned especially looking back I knew that it was I don't think any division one coach can do their job because the equations are unequal right like their job depends on wins and losses and we right. got school, we got girlfriends or whatever. So the match is trying to get both of those going in the same direction. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, Park Hill, Coach, the four years playing under Coach Park Hill were very challenging and difficult. 
you had to be you had to become uh, tough or you wouldn't make it. So mentally and physically tough or you wouldn't make it. And after those four years, I played professionally for 12. And after college, really, I was prepared for anything and everything that hit me. So didn't matter what type of coach I had next. Defensively, I was solid. Offensively, I knew what I wanted to do. So right. he prepared me for real life. Right. And he always used to say that, too. I, I, I mean, I don't know if you remember that, but that, that was a recurring theme throughout. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, for me, I'm, I'm closer to him now as an adult than I was back then. But I don't. And, and as a coach, that's what I'm hoping my players say about me in 10 years. I hope. Exactly. Right, right. So oh, I, you mentioned after college you played pro. You, you did one year in Portugal, but you jumped um, over to Japan. That had to be a culture shock. And tell me about that transition and how you kind of changed the game over there. Uh, yeah, so Portugal, the year in Portugal was interesting. Basketball-wise and just going out on my own and making some money. So it was tough. I had to fight for my paycheck. Back in the day, uh, some teams just didn't pay you or they, they didn't pay you on time. So there were times when I had to go into the front office and say, hey, I'm not playing unless you pay me. Give me my money. <laughs> and I'm 20, 21 years old, 22 years old. So I brought that attitude to Japan. In, in Portugal, I had all this free time and I was bored. So I told my agent I wanted a, a job as well as playing. And in my mind, a job was selling shoes at a mall or doing something, right? Just doing something. <laughs> well, Toyota, the Toyota job came up and I ended up coming to Japan and I was in the international marketing department of Toyota. And, like, that's a grown man, editing, grown man job. A magazine. Yeah, it was crazy. And it was a full-time job. So I had a full-time job and basketball. And, and the language, like how quickly did you pick it up? I'm still picking it up 32 years later. Uh, <laughs> I, I studied a little bit back then. I had uh, friends that would help me out, Japanese friends that would help me out with certain words and phrases. Went to school every now and then when I had a chance. Um, it, it, took, it took a long time. I'm st I still can't really read it and write it, but that's not what my job entails. Right. So you, you get there, and uh, I think the first year, you weren't playing a lot, but you were killing them because the league was more structured a little bit differently with their Americans, right? Yeah, they had two Americans per team, and 95% of them were 6'10 and above centers. Right. So for me, that was a field day. Because you were inside out, right? I was outside in. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. I was outside in. Yeah, so you were thinking free first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I took him outside, and I could defend a little bit on the post. But so I became I, I the other player and myself, Jeff uh, Jeff Gromos from Fairfield University. We split time. Uh, I led the league in scoring and was second in rebounding, averaging about twenty minutes a game, and. I didn't think I was going to stay in Japan, to be honest with you. I, I liked it, but I, I had the NBA in my mind. After I graduated from college, I was invited to some camps. and I went to Houston, and I didn't make it. So I still had the NBA in my mind. But after that first year, I did really well, and they, they offered me a lot more money. Money talks. <laughs> yeah. And so now the, the the other teams that you were playing against your first year, they kind of have to adjust who they're bringing on because they need yeah. somebody that can guard you, right? Yes. Yeah, so a lot of the players, they started bringing in six, seven, six, eight wings. Um, so, yeah, the, the league kind of shifted a little bit. Uh, look at you making changes, dude. Uh, and, and who were some of uh, maybe some of the players you played against in your career that uh, Americans or Penn Staters would know? Ed Fogle. <laughs> played against and with, right? Played against and with Ed Fogle. Uh, 
I don't know if you guys remember Stevie Thompson from Syracuse. Stevie? Uh, Steve Bardo? He does a lot of our games now for Big Ten Network. Yeah, he actually – I played against him for years, and when he left, oh, I, I took I, – I, I took I went to his team. Was it Moses Scurry? Weren't you – didn't well, play Moses, a little bit? Moses Scurry was there, yeah, yeah. And then – and then one clown from Stanford named Howard G. Wright. Howard G. Wright, yeah, from <laughs> from uh, Stanford, played in the NBA a little bit. Became uh, how, good friends. What were those? What were those days like uh, on the court with him? Like playing with or against him? Howard, so I played against him for a few years. Uh, just a strong dude, man. Hard to guard. Can't shoot free throws. Can rebound. <laughs> Yeah, we had a lot of fun. He he, uh, he tortured me. He he came to Toyota for a few years, so we played together. He tortured me in practice inside, and I tortured him outside. All right, so it was an, it was an even trade. Uh, I, I get that. Yeah. Right. So so you retire, and then um, you move back to uh, San Diego, right? And yeah, tell me about what you did. Well, I you're you're skipping a major part of my career. Are we talking? We want to talk about the cup of coffee. I, I, I'm sorry, I was going to get to that, but we'll talk about the the, the uh, cup of coffee in uh, Atlanta because that was that was cool listening to you talk about just going through like uh, preseason and all that and how how different it was. Yeah, uh, I mentioned earlier that I had the NBA in my mind, and after four years in Japan, I don't know if you remember Pete Newell. Yeah, coach, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Pete Newell really loved Japan, and he came to Japan quite a bit to do camps and clinics. And he saw me my fourth year in Japan after a game. He came up to me, and he said, Tom, he said, why aren't you in the NBA? <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, I'm thinking about it. He's like, no, get over there. So that was kind of an, an impetus. It was interesting. I always remember that conversation. And I was planning on doing it, but that really put me over the top. So after that season, I, I right. Well, to, it's, it's probably you know, because you you just gotten into a, to a routine or something, and although it was in your mind, it wasn't top of mind, and you just yeah, needed that you, little it, push. It was the frog in hot water. You just get comfortable. I was comfortable with the lifestyle I had there. Um, I had a girlfriend and. Yeah, I, I just kept pushing it off, pushing it off. And I finally, it, it was literally, I was in contract talks for a fifth season and I stopped it and uh, made the leap. Right, and there, there's risk to that because, you know, they're, they're running concurrently. So if you, if you don't make it, then it's risky getting back over to Japan. But, I mean. Yeah, it's, I was 28 years old, 27. Uh, I turned 28 when I went to, went to went to Atlanta. So I'm not young anymore, but it was something that I felt I needed to do for myself. I had set that goal in my mind when I was five years old and just really wanted to uh, give it a shot one more time. So you've been playing in Japan. Now you're playing with like NBA all-stars. Who, who are the guys on the – I know the answer to these, but I'm acting like I don't know. Who are the guys on the team, and what was that first, let's say, the first day like of camp? Well, so I had the, I had the rookie free agent camp. Uh, so I was there for two or three months before the vets got there. It went down from 50 to 12. We went to Orlando, and we played some games with Orlando and uh, some other teams. And I made it went from 12 to five. So now there were five guys trying out that they invited to the rookie for agent camp. And that's when I started playing against uh, Mookie Blaylock, Stacey Ogman, uh, Kevin Willis, John Conkak. Um, and in the summer, that was the year that Dominique Wilkins was traded to Boston, but he still lived in Atlanta. So after our team practices, there would be 10 to 15 guys sitting on the sideline and we'd play pickup ball. And it was just NBA guys <laughs> just sitting on the sideline, just waiting for next, who's got next and winner stays on. So I had to guard Dominique Wilkins quite a bit. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, that was fun. I, I, I get on you a little bit about defense, but I, I, I you, you were guarding twos and uh, and you always had threes because you were a three, but you were guarding guards like in college. So, I, I'll, yeah, I'll give you- I, 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 I became a better defender, much better defender after Penn State. I got better during my years at Penn State. Um, I got better in, as a professional, just just with experience. Um, back in the day, they never tested like wingspan. Never, I never got tested for wingspan. What was your wingspan? I don't. I, I mean, seven one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that might have been a metric that we wa- might want to know. <laughs> Can you believe they never tested that back in our day? Uh, hey, I was just trying. We were in those little short shorts, man. We had bigger, you know, issues going on than yeah. your, your, your wingspan. Uh, so that that Atlanta experience, you, you actually made the team. I the, made the team. Um, the we had eight preseason games. It was amazing how they did it. We had eight preseason games. I started four, and I didn't play in three. I believe two or three. And the last preseason game, I didn't. I, I thought it was done. I thought I, they, they weren't going to select me. And uh, I started against the Nets the last preseason game, and I was just like, "All right, well, let's light it up." So I ended up. Uh, I think I had twenty three and eight that game. Yes, sir. Yeah. So then you know you belong there, and then it's just a numbers game, right? And then and that basically told my. I, I told myself I I'm good enough to play in this league even if I don't get selected. Uh, the next day, the five guys that were trying out walked into the locker room, and Lenny Wilkins was the head coach. None of the coaches were in the locker room. We didn't talk to any of the coaches. The way you found out that you made the team, you had your name above a locker. <laughs> and so I walked into the locker room with these other four guys, and only two of us were going to make it. I walked into the locker room, and above my locker, it said ball boy. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> and Craig Elo was riding the stationary bike in the locker room because he was rehabbing his knee. And he saw me. And he said, he said, Tom, he's like, your locker's right here. <laughs> Man. Phenomenal. Oh, that is, that is awesome. Yeah, that was, that's a day I'll never forget. Now, I, I remember you telling me that story. I was just like, man, that that whatever thirty seconds you thought you got cut to. I mean, what a, a oh big man, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And then and then I get there. Um, we have practice right away, so I get dressed and I get on the court. And uh, yeah, what's his name? Played with had played at Illinois. It wasn't uh, Bardo. No, 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 no. Kendall Gill or Norman or? Ken Norman. Ken Norman and I would battle and practice all the time during during the month of the training we had. I don't think he liked me. So he, he, he runs up by me. I'm jogging around the court. He runs by me. So what, what do you think it was about you that you know, he's just testing the rookie or was it uh, personality-wise? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, we battled. We were in the same position. Yeah. It was funny. Lenny did some uh, – Coach Wilkins did some things in practice that were just all competitive. So we'd go five on five half court, and if I s- scored on uh, Ken, Norman, he'd say, run it again, same play. So I, I, if I kept scoring, Ken was, Ken was getting called out. And then, and then when we switched OD, defense to offense, you know, Ken was pissed, and he would just beat me up. <laughs> Down low. <laughs> Well, that explains it. Yeah, that that explains it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, yeah. what a what a great experience, and I'm sure you've taken. And this was actually when I was going to bring it up, but I'm sure you've taken some of that experience from Atlanta, and and even Coach Parkhill, and gotten it into what you take pull from that to your coaching methods. Or, yeah, or no, so maybe you haven't. Without a doubt, those experiences were they formed who I am now, and a lot of it. Um, formed my philosophy. A lot of Coach Parkhill's teachings um, are kind of the bedrock for what I do as a coach. 
obviously the times have changed. Um, I've become more, I don't know, I think I'm more empathetic than coach was. I really try to, I'm hard on people, but I really need to build them up as well. And it's just what I do. It's just kind of my philosophy, but right. Parker was well, definitely in there. Yeah, and we thought uh, we thought he was a taskmaster, but everything he did was for a reason. You know, like what what spots we were supposed to be at, but he was essentially kind of overcompensating for some of the deficiencies we had on the team. Um, and, you know, and you got to look at the time of his life too. He was thirty. He was mid thirties, man. Yeah, he was yeah. under a lot of pressure. No, no question, no question. And I always yeah. tell people. I don't I don't remember ever me getting yelled at. I was just part of the, the team that was getting yelled at and I expected it because that's what college coaches do. Now you maybe you might have been a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we all had our I think we all had our time under the well, bright light. Oh, like when I was in the tank with the shooting, you know, like I look back now, I, I just did this podcast with my high school, some of the high school guys in Troy, and uh I, I think I downplayed how much uh that tendonitis like I felt like I was getting stabbed in the knee every time I jumped yeah and it, it really messed with me mentally and, I, and in hindsight I acknowledged that I, it was more than I thought but he never really yelled at me during that time he you know he I think he was thinking don't yell because it'll make it worse so I thought that he was even more empathetic than maybe he even needed oh. to be my like, my my time under the hot light was freshman kind of like the beginning of our freshman campaign, we got blasted at Navy. And I, I came in, I was actually lucky enough to start. I was a starter from the beginning. And I was a three man for the first three games, I think. And Navy, uh, we got blasted. Still a record, but you know that, right? That's the worst loss yeah. in Penn State history, tied with the 93 team who lost to Indiana at Bloomington. That's something yeah. we should be proud of. And we also have the record for the – Lowest point total during the shot clock era. Was I in that game? We were in that game. I was against Temple. Um, 36 points. I don't think I was playing. I think I was hurt. <laughs> so you're not going to own that? I ain't part, part, part of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're you're definitely freshman year. And, and I do owe you an apology because I think somebody asked me about the Oklahoma game, and when I was like, oh, man, this dude's next level when you're going at the coaches, I just automatically assumed it was defense because that's really what set Coach off, but it wasn't offense. Nah. So straighten that story out. So, yeah, after the Navy beatdown, we we go to Oklahoma, away, away at Navy, away at Oklahoma, and I think we were starting three freshmen. So They had Mookie, this is uh, Ricky Grace, uh, Harvey Grant. I mean, they had a – Bomb squad. It was Oklahoma. <laughs> Number one or two in the country, Oklahoma I think. In the mid-80s. Yeah, mm -hmm. Billy Tubbs was the head coach. So they were good. Uh, we go there, and the coach moved me to the four spot. So I wasn't the three anymore. I was I was playing four. So I started at the four spot, and uh, we call the timeout. I'm walking. To, well, let me, let me walk it back to the day before, right? So the day before, we're having practice. And my parents and family had driven in from Colorado to Oklahoma to see the game. And it's like a 12 hour drive or so. It's not close. So they, they drove into Oklahoma and uh, the coach let them watch practice. And it was my time to just, they, they were killing me the whole practice. And I, I remember talking to my mom after practice, she was in tears. She was crying. She's like, why are they just yelling at you all the time? Why, why, what's going on? I'm like, mom, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Shirley, her baby's getting whipped. Oh, no. Yeah, she was crying. My mom was crying. That's and, crazy. And, and now they're seated behind the bench during the Oklahoma game, right? So this whole this whole week was they were just getting on. And as you know, you may me, want to explain of, like we were talking about how specific coach was. So on our on our break, the three and the four had to be on like the yeah. same side of the court all the time, yeah, we, right? We were robots, so the three man had to run down the right side, the two man had to run down the left, and the four man and the five man. I think one was a rim runner and trailer, whatever it was. I can't remember the exact formation, but I went from three to four. So I was doing my job. I was running down my lane, and uh, 
they call it Penn State calls a timeout. I'm walking to the bench. And before I can even like get into the huddle, Brian Hill, the assistant coach, is just calling me and oh. Oh. <laughs> and I snapped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a nice <laughs> And it, saw, it sounds so warm and fuzzy. Like people see these things go on, whether it's football, basketball, they see these things happen in the heat of the moment. And yeah. that was that was like a level nine or ten snapback on your part. And I was just like <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, and that's what scared me more than anything, right? So I'd never snapped back at a coach before. And uh, I basically dropped an F bomb and said, you know, I'm the foreman. And uh and once I dropped the F-bomb, I looked at, like, the reaction of, like, you and, and Paul and these other guys, and they're just like, whoa. And they all stopped, and everybody kind of went away from me. I'm like, and in that. Hey, we in didn't that, want that smoke. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, hey. And I, during that, it was during that, um, there was like a two or three second pause there. I was like, oh, I'm done at Penn State. I'm, they're going to, I'm done. I thought I was done, to be honest. Oh, you did? That's how I, did. Bad I didn't think that. I just thought you were going to get it in the next practice or something. I thought I was done. In that instance, I thought I was done. And uh, <laughs> Park Hill, when I said I was the foreman, I think it kind of hit Coach Hill, and he was just like that. And, and Park Hill was like, yeah, he's the foreman. And uh, that was it. Done. Over. And, yeah. and I think you got a lot of respect from the coaches from that because it showed your competitiveness um, and that you weren't some wilting flower or whatever. But it was, <laughs> it, it was, it was jarring for a kid to, you know, grew up in a house where people never yelled and you respect their elders. But you were right. Uh, I don't yeah. know that I would have handled it that way. But our freshman yeah. year, you know, it was tumultuous because we had a lot of injuries. And then, you know, my, the, my roommate, Tony, the point guard, um, he wasn't eligible, so I got thrown into the fire too. Right. Um, but we were, I, I feel like I was just too naive to even be freaked out about it. Like, no, I enjoyed it. I, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't want to sit on the bench. I, I wanted to be out there and doing my thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we had some, you know, it was tumultuous get up and down, but senior year, this was, you know, even up and going in when we had that bad loss to West Virginia and that practice where, you know, I don't even think Coach rolled out the b basketballs. Well, I broke my nose uh, in that loss to West Virginia. So I missed the practice oh, after. Right, that. right. And that seemed like the darkest days because we're seniors. And we were really adamant about going out winners as seniors. And I think that was huge for the culture because then we had freshmen like Money and Freddie, Dave yeah. and Ron. And that kind of, I think we were kind of like the transition in between what had happened coaches previous years to the next four years. Like they just went on a run and, yeah. you know, just step by step, they figured out, you know, and I, you know, Freddie still gets on me about him with the basketball, but it was important to me that we compete, but we're still teammates. And, right. it, you know, that's when I snapped. <laughs> Because it was like, our, it was our last dance. I mean, we, we, and it was great because after that, you know, we went on the run in the postseason and uh, we hadn't been there in a while. So the, uh, as far as far as where we started and where we ended, that I don't remember a lot of things that I did personally, but just yeah. ha getting 20 wins and being postseason was like, I think we I think we accomplished. And coach, you know, he talks fondly about us and that's awesome. Uh, yeah. But we, I think there was strength in numbers because we just had a really good class. And we also knew how to separate the seriousness of the court to this, the outside off the court. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. I, the I, specifics I, of our four years, especially on the basketball court, I, I remember certain instances and highlights. But what I take most from those four years is just my friendships with you and Bruce and everybody. Yeah. That was the fun part. Yeah, the locker room, the bus rides, you know, um, the maybe uh, Atlantic 10 tournament, cutting yourself. Um, yeah, just, just highlights. All those highlights. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming into the room, pacing around, not telling Bruce and I what was going on. Like, Tom, what's, what's, what's wrong with you, man? Going into the biggest game of our careers, and you decide to cut your – your, the webbing in your finger with a butter knife. It was uh, a hard roll, man. The knife didn't go through. 
<laughs> those the the Philadelphia had the hard rolls in, in the uh, in the hotel, and that, I mean, thank goodness. I mean, you had a good game, but Ed went off that game. I had a good second half. I I had zero points at halftime. I, I walked into the game. You guys were already, already lathered up, and I was I just I was in the emergency room. That's right. With my dad, it was a snowstorm. I remember that. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, yeah you so came in cold, but you warmed it up. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I had zero at half. I think it ended up with sixteen. That's Not that's bad. a that's a damn good hand. I mean, with a with a severed finger. I mean, it could have been a lot worse. <laughs> all right, so getting back to all right, so after your career, you know, you decided to hang it up. And how did you choose San Diego? Um, and what were you doing in San Diego? I bought a home in San Diego during my career. My wife, Aiko, uh, didn't really want to live in Colorado. She wanted to live near the ocean. So we found a nice home in a brand new home in San Diego in the late 90s and bought it. And Best investment I've, I've ever made. Yeah, real estate. Don't I know it? Uh, yeah. And, and, and what was your vocation? At, uh... So uh, after I retired from hoops, I was kind of lost. I, I immediately, I was 34, and I immediately applied for the FBI. I've always wanted to do that. I applied for the FBI. This is in 2001, May, May or June, and uh, did did all the testing, did the interviews in San Diego, and actually got the stamp of approval uh, to move forward in the, in the process. So they sent my file to DC, and while my file was in DC, 9-11 happened. And obviously everything got delayed, and I f finally got the answer of no, and the way they explained it to me is after 9-11, the FBI really changed their, their thinking on what type of agents they wanted before it was boots on the ground and, uh, you know, that, that type of detective type of work. Yeah, face-to-face -face kind of belly-to-belly -belly kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but after 9-11, it turned into more following the money, accountants. Uh, Analytical. Yeah, so that knocked me out of it. Uh, and so how did you got, get on with single tech or single, single touch? Uh, Howard, my buddy Howard was at Qualcomm and I was looking for work and he introduced me to this company and I got in at a marketing level. It was a small startup company, nine employees and got in at a marketing level and within three years was uh, EVP kind of running running it and we grew and we went public and I was there for seven years. Right. And you had, you had like, you were essentially the uh, the wingman to the band and access to yeah. a private jet, kind of living a good life, right? Oh, uh, I don't, I mean, it was. <laughs> he was, a, he was, a, he was a bit it was much. It was interesting. And we, the company was growing and we were working with some <clears throat> some bigger companies trying to get them into the wireless industry. It was hard work and there were some interesting times for sure. Well, you, when you got uh, access to a private jet, that's, that's... I didn't have access to a private jet. Uh, yeah, you sort of did. I mean, let's not split hairs here. So then all of a sudden, out of, out of the blue, or I'd like you to explain how this how it came to be, all of a sudden, Japan's knocking on your door to coach. How did that come During, during the seven years, <clears throat> I actually wanted to be a coach after my playing days, and I didn't have an opportunity. Um, I, there was a couple chances that I didn't get hired. When I retired, I had two kids, mortgage, two cars, and thankfully I had some savings. So I, during the year after my retirement, I finally found a job. And um, during those seven years, I was starting to coach my son's AAU team. So I created an AAU team and I started coaching and I really wanted to become a coach that really kind of reignited the fire in me to become a coach. And I was telling my wife, I said, look, I'm going to start looking for coaching gigs because I want to be a coach. And she knew I, that's kind of what I wanted to do. 
Did you were, I out mean, of the blue. Out of the blue, I got a I got an email from my old translator from Japan, and the title was "You want to be a coach." I was like, "Yeah," well, and we started talking. What was the gist of it? Like the email, like how? I mean, out of all the people to reach out to, I know. So it was a women's team called uh, Japan Energy or Enios, which is a big gas and oil company here in Japan. And uh, they had a really good women's team. <clears throat> and they were getting uh, a six foot three inch girl from high school who wasn't a typical center. And they wanted to teach her outside play as well and uh, inside as well. And they thought that I could be someone who could do that because that's how I played. And I spoke Japanese. So that was kind of the reasoning that they used to get me uh, to, to reach out to me. Right. I, and I remember we, we would have conversations and you'd be asking me because, I mean, you're doing well just monetarily with your, your job. But I distinctly remember saying, and I feel the same way about my brother, like there's just certain people put on earth to be coaches. And I always felt like that was really, really? Your, yeah. your calling and you were just kind of filling the time until the opportunity presented itself. Yeah, you you yeah. angered over that. Like it wasn't like it was like yes, I'm jumping at it. You, I, I, it seems like they I, came at you several times. I think, right? Well, I had two kids. I had a good job, um, and yeah, they. I actually flew out there just to see what the players were like and to see where I might be living in our practice facilities. And when I got there, man, it, the women just are gym rats. They just they're in the gym constantly. They play at a very high level, very serious about their job. And uh, the company really backed them. So it was kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. And, and at that time, uh, Japan women's basketball was not on the map. And uh, you uh, were... They were always uh, decent. They, they were in the top 20, I think. Okay. Yeah. It, internationally, like an inter international play, they work like maybe f top five or top 10. You're saying they're somewhere in the middle there. Top 20. Yeah. They were in the okay. between. Yeah. They were like 18th to 20th, I think. So you're coaching a pro team, but you're also helping with the national team, right? Yes. Yeah, so they, I was invited by two different uh, – there was a couple different head coaches for the national team my first four years. Uh, in Japan, and they both offered me an opportunity to be an assistant coach. So I took them up on the offer. And so the second time I was there, we went to the Rio Olympics. As I was an assistant. Yeah. What was that experience like? Uh, I remember seeing your, your tall red hair in the crowd during the opening ceremonies. That must have been surreal. That was phenomenal. I... I was trying to soak it all in, and we had a really good run in the Olympics. We, we ended up in eighth place, but I felt like it could have been a lot better. I thought we were a top five team in terms of uh, just style and athleticism and our speed. I really thought we could have been better, but the players, I don't felt like they really believed in themselves as much and they were giving too much praise to the other teams. And I thought mental toughness was lacking a little bit. So after Rio, everybody was excited. And I, I was just, I wasn't that happy. I thought it could have been more. So after the, after Rio, I was offered the head coaching job at my club team after. Real quick, real quick. Yeah. Like, I don't know if a lot of people remember, like, you were giving USA a run at, at uh, in London, and you're up. Oh, uh, Rio, Rio. In Rio, I mean. We were down two points with a minute 20 to go in, at half, and then they went on, like, a 10-0 run with a minute to go. So I go into the locker room, I'm pissed. But they were all just not, not they were kind of happy, and I'm like, what are you guys doing? We got a chance here. And the second half, America just throttled us by – I, I think we lost by forty five or something. So at that point, you're saying if I ever get that get that job, I got to work on the mental as much as the physical. Was, was that that, no, at that point, I said I told myself I'm done being an assistant coach because you didn't feel like you had control of the destiny you wanted. Yeah, I, I really respected the head coach and 
really like him to this day. We're still friends. I just, we're just different. We have different philosophies on coaching and I was looking forward to becoming a head coach. Cause you gotta, you gotta, I was seven years into my coaching in Japan and it was all as an, as an assistant. One year I was an associate head coach, but it becomes a time where you just want to play your brand of basketball. So I had that opportunity going back to my club team right after Rio. And uh, while we were in Rio, the JBA came, asked me if I wanted to be the assistant coach for the national team again. I turned him down. I said, no, I don't want to do that anymore. And I thought that was it. And they came back about a month later and asked if I wanted to be the head coach. There you go. And you, yeah. Was it like, let me think about it? You're like, yes, it's about time. I you said, yeah, yeah. No, I definitely was, was interested in it for sure. And you, so you, I'm trying to get the timing right. I think once you became head coach is what, when you started coming over here during the off season and like observing other college and pro coaches, is that? I did that. I did that when I was in my club team as well. I did it. But I, I did it as uh, when I was a national team player, yeah. And what yeah. were you getting out of that? I like to go study. You look for drills. Uh, at first, I was looking for drills and different actions on the court, plays. And I still look for that. But what I really started looking at was how coaches coached and kind of the, the atmosphere that they created. So I went to a lot of different NBA teams and college teams. I, w I went all over the place, especially on the East Coast. Yeah, and then you um, were you were also for a long time. Seems like you were like volunteering uh, for the Mercury. Yeah, I have. Yeah, you must have got some great uh, experience out of that too. Yeah, Corey Gaines was the head coach. Corey's a good friend of mine. He he played uh, under Paul Westhead, so they had that fast break uh, action. Oil on my arm out. He was yeah, he, yeah, he played with Hank Gathers, yeah. So they had that fast break, which we never had at Penn State, and uh, tried to learn his system. So the, that year and a half, I didn't get paid, but I would, I would drive to Phoenix from San Diego, which is about five and a half, six hours, stay with Corey from Monday to Friday, and then if Phoenix had road games, I didn't go on the road games, and I'd drive back to San Diego, be with my family on the weekend, drive back Monday, and do the whole thing over again. I did that for a season and a half. Uh, and, and there had to be some gold out of that. So, so, that, so now well, you're... I coached, I coached uh, Brittany Griner, uh, Diana Taurasi, Penny Taylor, the best of the best. Goats. <laughs> Goats. The goat, actually. Yeah, uh, and obviously you. I'm thinking you coach them differently, maybe than you coach the the your teams in Japan. I was an assistant coach, and uh, Corey was phenomenal. Corey let me do whatever I wanted to do, and Corey's a very uh, he doesn't yell much, and he's really offensive minded, and I'm I was more defensive minded. So every now and then I'd get I'd, I'd raise my voice. <laughs> you say this in such a just by the way you're saying it <laughs> most won't pick up on it but uh, yeah i see that the, the irony in that statement um yeah. but, well i asked you about that because you were telling me how defensive minded and i made a joke what do you know about defense and your answer right. was very telling and you said I, I like to teach the way i hated to be guarded yes and that's exactly right yeah, I, I would have never even thought that, but it makes total sense. Yeah, because I was I was a scorer on a yeah I, I was a scorer in my playing days, and I saw a bunch of different defenses that just you had to really figure out to continue scoring. You had to figure things out, and that's kind of what I did. And actually, this is that you bring up a good point. When I was coaching the club team, we were the tallest team in Japan. We had all the centers from the national team. We were really big. And every now and then we would lose to these small teams in, in, in the league. I'm like, how are we losing? And, and I learned how small teams can really affect and play well against bigger teams. So when I became the national team coach, now I'm the smallest – I'm the coach of the smallest team almost in the world. We were, we were the second smallest team in the Olympics in Tokyo. 
and but I was in, in, I was using those techniques that I learned right. while I was the big team in the league. Yeah, and so you have uh, also you're dealing with some of your players are playing in the WNBA. So one you're player. you're coaching or one yeah, and you're coaching like different like the rosters, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Our roster was changing all the time. It was a continuous four year tryout. And what do you think? Like looking back, because you know, like it, it, there was such a uh, you guys were such the darlings of the uh, Japan Olympics. Uh, let's talk about that for a little bit. Like that whole experience. I know. I remember when you came to visit me in State College, and we we always had to go kiss the ring of Russ Rose. And I remember you saying, "Russ, we're going to be in a, a gold medal game against." Uh, the United States, and he didn't laugh like I don't believe you. He kind of was more like, "You just better, you know, prepare him, or you better be ready for him." That's what I got out of yeah. it. But it was yeah, kind when of I, when I became head coach in 2017. I had my press conference as, when they introduced me as the head coach, and one of the questions was, "What's your goal?" And I, I, I told him, I said, I want to play America in the finals of the Olympics and win. Yeah. And, and they were kind of probably looking at you cockeyed a little bit, huh? They all were. I don't <laughs> care. I believed it. Right, right. And I remember that was what I pulled out of your conversation with Russ. It's like it really didn't matter. Even though Russ was supportive and he really wasn't, like, clowning you, it was almost like knowingly you, you just better be ready to do it, but you had full confidence. And quite frankly, you didn't care if he was supportive or not because you were focused on that's what I'm doing. And if you don't right. believe it, you can't. How are you going to get your girls to believe it? Right, and it, it was a it was a process for sure. I think the girls were shocked at the beginning, and then once we started having success in 2017, we won the Asia Cup. We beat Australia, the world's number two team. We beat China. We won the championship. And then in 2018, we had the World Cup, and I was missing three starters, two, two retired and one got hurt. So I brought a really young team. We, I had two 19-year-olds, and they got extensive playing time. Um, and we, won, we went two and two. We lost to Spain, who eventually got second place. Um, but we had beaten Spain in, the, in, a pre, in a game before the World Cup, in a practice game we beat them. So we were confident. And then uh, we beat Belgium, who ended up getting fourth. We beat them in overtime. We beat Puerto Rico. Uh, we ended up losing to China, which was the only time I've ever lost to China. But they're 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 the number six in the world or seven in the world. So it's not you play them ten times, you might lose once or twice for sure. Yeah. But we got better. So we didn't reach our goal in the World Cup. But we got we got a little bit more confident in what we were doing and and more experience with some of the younger players. 2019 Asia Cup beat beat Australia in the semis by 12, beat China in the finals, win the win the win the cup again. Uh, three months later, we're playing in the Olympic qualifying Asia Olympic qualifying tournament. Since we already qualified for the Olympics as the host. Australia was in our group. They brought Brittany, uh, they brought uh, Liz Cambridge. They brought their A team, their A, their AA team. And since we already qualified and we had just beaten them, I was, I brought six players that I was trying, that I was trying out. So it was right. my B team pretty much. We beat them by 13. <laughs> I remember that conversation too, because you, I think that was maybe the happiest I've heard you because you, you did have a little bit of the uh, typical coach gloom and doom. Uh, we got to get that, but you truly were proud of what they had accomplished. Miss Cambridge is, is six, nine. She's a beast. She dropped 50 something in the WNBA the, that year. And my tallest player was six, three and she got in foul trouble in the first quarter. So I brought in a 21 year old who was 6'1. And we, in the first quarter, we went eight for eight from three. <laughs> we, were up, we were up like 33 to 10 in the first quarter. It was crazy. Yeah, with your B team and their AA team. And it sounds like you, your girl was in Liz's head. Yeah, she got a tech. She got, she got uh, teed out. She got two techs. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is brilliant. That is brilliant. Yeah, that 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 was like pure uh, joy. I could hear it in your voice that the way because that I think that told you your girls definitely that they had arrived and they could play with anybody. I That's think that a big was win, man. Yeah, you beat world number two by double digits with not not your best. I didn't even have my captain, my my center Takata, who you saw how valuable she was in the Olympics, right? She was she was she's our she's our our solid inside your glue, player. That, that's your glue girl. She was, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, we beat him by double digits. So we really gained a lot of confidence in that. Um, so once we got to, after all the delays with the Olympics, we, we played th four practice. We played Portugal before the Olympics, which helped us out a lot. And then we played Belgium, beat them. Canada beat them, <clears throat> Puerto Rico beat them. So we had three practice games right before the Olympics and we just went to work and we got better every day. And Good Canada thing. was Canada was fourth in the world. Belgium, I think is whatever they were, sixth. And we were just, nobody was stopping us. Yeah, so you, you went in on a roll. You had great momentum going in. And yeah. when, like watch, I mean, I watched every game that they televised, but the one against France was just like the first game or the the semifinals. The semifinals when you chopped them up was like, I mean, the way that your team was it, it was it was like a clinic. Yeah, and, and it wasn't like you were. I mean, you're out there coaching, but it, you could tell that the, number one, the girls played together a lot, and they had great chemistry, great confidence, and just the precision, like. It was like a exacto knife the way you were chopping them up. We had <clears throat> we had months. We had a couple months to prepare for France because they were in our group and they were our first game, and we had to win that first game. So we prepared for France. I knew their offense better than they did, probably, and so we were ready. The first the first game we played them in the group, <clears throat> I thought we were going to beat them by fifteen because I didn't think that their d defense was was good enough. Um, they were physically very good, athletic, but we 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 only won by four, just because we weren't used to their size and length, and their on-ball defense was really there was a lot of pressure. Their weak, their help defense was slow, but once we got by that first game and we played them in the semifinals, our girls knew. I mean, we knew what All they the did. Yeah. yeah, we knew what they were good at, and I didn't know we were. I didn't. We were up by twenty-seven with five minutes to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's right, right. And then the uh, the and U.S. One of the this is one of the thing. One of the prouder things um, that I take from the Olympics in the semifinals and finals, every single one of my players scored. Oh, so I didn't even not know only that. played, not only played, every single player scored. So you you have balance, and they even the twelfth person uh, had confidence to contribute out there, yeah. and, and so well, like they're going into the goal. What was their uh, persona? What were they? What were they like going? Because sometimes it's hard to gauge whether a team is ready or not. Um, I'm sure they went in there with total confidence, but one hundred percent, there was not a person in that locker room who thought we were going to lose. So. Credit to America, they jumped on us. They 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 learned from our group play I, game. I was gonna say that. Man, they jumped on us. They really they played a defense we had never we had not seen up until they switched everything, denied everything. Not only did they deny, they face guarded everything. So basically they made us play mismatch drive, and if you can finish in the paint, finish in the paint. That was it. I it was tough. Right. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I was thinking the same thing. Like, you weren't going to be sneaking up. Even going into the Olympics, from what you had told me, I was thinking he's not going to be sneaking up on anybody anymore, especially yeah. the USA. Because you gave him that scare in Rio. And I'm sure well, they were we gave him a scare. Yeah, we gave him a scare in Washington, D.C., too. We were up after three against them. Yeah. DC. So, yeah, and I'm thinking they're, they're watching you now. Like, where maybe when you first started with international basketball in Japan – yeah. They weren't even – it was like maybe a second thought. But I, I would be surprised. And maybe you've – have you talked to, like, Tarasa or any of them about the, the Talk game? Talked to her 
talked to her right after the game, her and Sue Bird, and they were all very complimentary. Uh, Diana basically said, uh, T, after you typically we scout like 15 minutes of a team and basically get their plays. She said, we had to watch every single one of your games. Yeah, yeah. That's respect right there. Yeah, she said, we still don't know what you guys are going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and you've also uh, developed a good relationship with Don Staley too, right? Yeah, yeah. Coach, uh, she came out four years ago. After they won the NCAA championship, she brought her team to Japan. Uh, we were preparing for the Asia Cup. So she brought her team out uh, with a young Asia Wilson, and um, yeah, we we played a few games with them. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So so you you have the Olympics. You guys are the talk of the town. You probably had a lot of offers. Just talk about like maybe what what you were thinking was next, uh, or and how you ended up. Now you're the head coach of Japan's men's team. Now, how you came to that uh, solution or? what they wanted, they wanted me to go to the men's side. They thought that as within the JBA, that was, that was the team that they really wanted to um, work on and get better. So, and they thought I was the guy for the job, which is in hindsight is, is I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So not a lot of times you go from the women to the men's side at such a high level. Right. Uh, of I don't I don't I can't think of a time where I've ever even heard of that. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of crazy, but it took me a while after the Olympics. It's just such a mental it's it's the the journey is so long and there's so much pressure um that after the Olympics there's obviously just a letdown, not a letdown, it's just I need I need time to think. So, I took about a month, month and a half off and thought about that offer and I got a I got an, a, a nice offer from a team in Europe and I was talking to some agents in, in America, but the timing of everything and um, the way the JBA I kind of proposed this, gave this offer to me. Yeah, I, I was kind of, it was kind of easy for me to make, make the jump. Right. And, and, uh would you say it's it's a little similar to when you uh, got involved with the women's internationally? In terms of in terms of their mentality, I think I that's one of the things I need to really work on is getting them to be confident in playing against teams across the globe and just a little bit tougher and believing in themselves a little bit more. Right. But right. The more the more difficult part is with the women, I had more time to practice. We had longer training sessions. And with the men, they have this, the B League, where the, they play 62 games a year and then playoffs. And so it's kind of um, my, my chance to get these guys together is a lot smaller. And then you have Rui Hachimoda and Yuta Watanabe in the NBA and uh, Yudai Baba's in, in the G League. So I've got three of my best players not even here, so I can't practice with them. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So, what do you? How do you prepare? Like, you want you want to go in. I'm guessing you want to go in, like as if you don't have them, but you also want to right. have the team prepared for like because chemistry is so key. Like, how yeah. do you walk that fine line? Well, I'm creating. I'm using a very similar style that I did with the women. That style basically is is NBA analytic basketball style. So I'm using that same system. And to be honest with you, I think Utah and those three guys will be able to fit this system very well. They're basically Almost plug and play. Now. Yeah, it's fun to play and they're basically running it now. Um, yeah, so it's tough. I want to build a team that they have to come in and adjust to. I don't want to have a team when those three guys come in, we adjust to them. They need to adjust to us. So right, right. That's what. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Great answer. Uh, yeah. Well, you said NBA analytics for somebody who doesn't really know. Like, can you give a little bit more on what that 
means without giving away? Yeah, so teams that are smaller that we don't have a six eight six uh, in women we didn't have a six eight six nine center. So basically, uh, I have a system where all five of my players can shoot threes, which puts pressure on the defense. They have to come out, and it opens up the paint. So I put a premium on shots inside the paint, layups. That's the shot we want to take, and or and or free throws. And the next shot we want to take is a three. So it's threes and paint twos and free throws. And in the and the women analytics hasn't come in. That's why I was very confident that we were going to win. Because uh, women basically with Brittany Griner and Liz Cambridge, you've got these ma- these big centers. So obviously they're playing power. 1980s basketball found it inside inside out yeah. first right. yeah so um somebody's at my door um you want me to get that yeah go ahead i'll pause hold up, hold up. okay how's that domino's pizza <laughs> no no i they're gonna they're gonna ring my doorbell again here in a minute i'm pretty no, sure that's okay so so so, they, talking- so the other countries are playing power basketball for the most part, which to me is like 1980s basketball, right? And yeah. analytics, a low post player, the, the low post shot is not a high percentage shot. If you if you incorporate passing it in the post and those turnovers and the missed shots and um, yeah, so it's not the highest percentage shot in the world. So, but the three point shot is if you can shoot it at a high level. We shot going into the championship game, we were shooting 40% as a team from three. Good. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> we led we led the Olympics in three point attempts, three point makes, three point percentage. Nice. Nice. So you're just gonna take that you're taking that to the men's game and you know, X's yeah. and O's are X's and O's. What any kind of nuances that you have to make an adjustment to? Not nuances. You want to. You really want to um, maximize the strengths of your team. So the strengths of Japan as a country, uh, for me, are, are is quickness, teamwork, because they work. They put in more hours than other teams. So teamwork, quickness. Um, they're really good at detailed things, passing, and so I really try to emphasize those types of things. And again, the the goal obviously is to be playing the United States for the gold medal in Paris. No, let me let me answer that. I got to let me get this real quick. 